So good evening, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to take my turn. And I have to tell you, it's awkward trying to see you with the lights glaring in our eyes. Uh, but at least we have our Secret Service microphones to help us out. Um, so welcome. If I haven't met you before, I am Frank Steele. I am the head of school of SCH Academy and very, very happy to be in that role and very excited about the work that we're doing. Um, and it's also been great working with Priscilla and Christine, not just on planning this evening, but on planning the program, um, not just for the upper school, but for our entire school. Um, it's been just profoundly exciting and meaningful work for all of us. It's a really unique time for us in our school to be able to think about uh, our education and what do we want to bring for all of our children, um, uh, your sons and daughters, and, and what, what kinds of education do they need. And so we've been thinking about it at a, at a lot of levels. At the opening, Priscilla said I would talk a little bit about how we're going to do this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, us organizationally, a little bit about design thinking, a little bit about project-based learning, and some specifics of what our faculty are doing, and then show you a, a short video of some things that are already happening in school. So how are we making this happen? It's, it's, as I said, it's a really exciting time for us, and it's a little bit of a unique time in the sense that very few schools that are two schools coming together with almost 300 years of tradition and experience and program get the chance to really rethink what they want to do and almost start from scratch. And so, as Christine pointed out, we're not exactly starting from scratch in the sense that we are maintaining the, the tremendous, um, rigorous uh, coursework that, that has been the foundation of our program. But we are starting over in a lot of ways in terms of how we want our students to think and learn. So on, on one level, we have three fairly significant structural changes that are impacting how we do our work. One is as a business. Um, you know that we have merged and that we are looking to uh, blend our organization together that way. And the way that impacts education is, um, as you know, last year we named single department heads for each department. So instead of having an English department head at Springside and CHA, history department head, et cetera, we now have a single department head for SCH who um, oversees curriculum pre-K through 12 in conjunction with the division heads. And so we now have curriculum being determined in a way that allows for our program to flow very smoothly from grade to grade and from division to division. Uh, while still allowing us to maintain our separate um, single sex um, uh, divisions so that lower school and middle school at each of the schools is still, are, are each still able to focus on what's best for the boys and the girls separately so that they are developing the same skills by eighth grade, but they're able to get there in the way that's uh, most relevant and most meaningful for them um, in that gender way as well. Uh, so that's, that's one change that we have going on. Uh, an, another change is that uh, we're, we're working on the overall business organization in terms of uh, making sure that all of our offices are um, coming together so that they can support the program um, and, and that we can put our resources into program um, as much as possible and, and make sure that we're giving you the best value for your dollar. Um, so uh, structurally, the last piece is that we have uh, the division heads, lower, middle, and upper school division heads, the deans of students of the upper school, and Jen Vermillion from our ed educational technology department overseeing all of our curriculum development work from the academic leadership perspective. And so as a result, we have much more um, continuous uh, development of curriculum that's aligned from division to division and uh, for boys and girls where they're separate and for boys and girls where they're together. So we're, we're tremendously happy with the work that we have been able to do as a team in terms of organizing um, our direction as a school, as a single educational entity. We, we um, are always in concert. Questions that we need to solve come up together. We solve them together, and we're able to make them uh, work the best for the students um, as, as possible. The, the second thing I want to talk about is design thinking, and, and sort of what does that mean to us? Uh, because if, if we're going to be moving in a new direction as a school, we as a faculty all have to understand what it is that we mean by that so that again, in lower, middle, and upper school, we are approaching it the same way. And uh, we all know that um, information is really um, 
ubiquitous now. It's cheap, anyone can find it. We could all pull our cell phones out if Priscilla hadn't told us to uh, put them away. And we could Google any fact that we wanted to um, and find information, find facts, uh, find knowledge. Uh, so increasingly, the, the burden on schools is not to convey simple information. It's to convey ways of using that information in meaningful ways and to teach our students how to create uh, meaningful knowledge and be able to solve problems with the information that they're able to access, to know good information from bad information and how to use it. And so design thinking is a way of having students realize that the old school model of 40 minutes of English and 40 minutes of history and 40 minutes of science and on like that um, isn't the w best way to use all of the things that you know and to construct meaningful knowledge. That students have to learn within themselves as learners how to tap, tap into their various elements of knowledge uh, and use them to solve problems, but also to realize that they may not have all the answers to a particular problem and that they have to draw on other people in other fields uh, to help solve problems and that some of the best work will happen because students and teachers are working together, first identifying the problem, then identifying other possible solutions to that problem, sort of the brainstorming and ideation phase where um, everybody gets to think about different ways of approaching a situation, then doing some uh, prototyping where uh, you actually build different models or try out different scenarios to solve the problem to see which ones might work the best before you finally settle on a particular outcome as the solution that you're going to go with. And so um, it's, it's a whole way of thinking about um, how do we look at problems, how do we identify what the issues are, and then how do we educate our students to tap into all the things they know and all the resources they have to be able to put their energies into helping to solve that problem. So that's, that's a piece of how we look at design thinking and what we want our students to have. Project-based learning. Sorry, I didn't want to show that yet. Um, I was told it took two clicks to make that happen. Um, so project-based learning is a different way of constructing classroom exercises. Um, I think those of us who, who went to school a fairly long time ago, I've been teaching for 30 years, so um, you can figure out how far back I was in high school. Um, I think we remember taking notes, doing our readings, studying, taking a test, and then maybe doing a project that might have been a diorama or a collage or something like that. Um, that's not the project-based learning that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about projects that are designed to be really key educational content that are designed to have students um, have some input into what some of the questions might be, where they learn really important material, sort of the key elements of a math course or a history course are part of the creating of the project. And especially, um, as, as Priscilla was talking about, what are the skills that students need going forward into colleges and the work world, um, to be able to present information in some very different and much more powerful ways than simply sitting and taking a test and writing in essay or short answer questions. That we want our students to be able to do um, much more significant uh, study, understanding of what some of the questions are, to determine what some of the knowledge that they need to be able to answer those questions, to go get some of that knowledge on their own, and to have their teachers be guides more than uh, the, the sage on the stage, uh, to, to, over, to use a well-worn phrase, but to have students have a, a much more active role in their education and for them to see the relevance of the work that they're doing in the classroom to the world that they are living in and to the lives that they are leading so that they have an understanding of why they are learning things that they're learning. Uh, the question that we hope to eradicate is, will this be on the test? <laughs> so um, we, we are looking at uh, changing the way we approach thinking about learning and we're changing the way that we look at having projects um, be part of student learning. So the, the project-based learning can happen separately within a class or it can happen uh, as will uh, for the ninth grade next year in um, ways instead of exams we'll be having um, 
little sections of days, three to five days, where departments will get together and design interdisciplinary units for students to study together with different teachers and different groups of students. So we expect this to be much more exciting, much more fun, much more relevant for our students. And so I would like to close with the video um, which we put together in-house, which is just some projects within the last 12 to 18 months here at school that are great examples of project-based learning from all five of our divisions. Uh, and, and again, as Priscilla did at the beginning, I want, to, I want to acknowledge our faculty and say that even as we have been planning the future of the school, our teachers have been making that future happen right now um, uh, in real time. Uh, we, we were uh, at our board meeting this past weekend and Priscilla and I both were able to say to the board that the work that we're doing is at this point really a grassroots movement within the school of really talented teachers working in these new ways already with our students. So um, just a, a, a few examples of the things that we're doing now. the D school model from Stanford. So basically, the first step is empathy. And that's something that I think a lot of especially students are not used to dealing with because you're usually very focused on yourself and your own success. But here, you have to look at, at what best benefits society, not you. Because in the real world, a lot of the times, you're dealing with other people. And that's not something you usually have to think about when you're in a classroom setting. Or taking an exam. Or taking an exam. <laughs> when you do pro use a project-based learning model, it allows you to have a lot more um, flexibility to express your understanding of the topic in a way that you are best able to. Throughout the second half of the year, we study Australia. And as a culminating activity at the end of our study, we decided that we would be immerse ourselves and the boys in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, they learned about animals. They learned about how it, why it's threatened, why it's important that we protect our reefs. We wrote about reefs. We wrote a rap. Mm -hmm. They did all sorts of things. And the boys really became, in four days, became quite professional proficient and knowledgeable about the importance of taking care of the reef. I liked doing art every day. I like doing art every day. I got to work with different teachers and mm -hmm. draw art and stuff. Hi, I'm Meredith and I'm in fifth grade and we did this really, really fun and cool science project and what it was is Miss Boyer, our science teacher, she assigned us a partner and an animal and what we did was we had to find out with our partner all cool facts about that animal and like what the animal ate, what ate that animal and then we got to record our voice with our partner and then after that we got to go on a field trip to see our animal and it was just a really really fun experience and a really fun project. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was about intelligent joy it was about kids coming together, solving a problem in ways they weren't used to. The very traditional ways to write a book report, but that isn't what we did. We took the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and brainstormed the many different ways kids have of learning. So there were projects in the physics lab where kids had to build something, they had to build a model, they had to test it out. There were projects with drama and writing. There were projects with cooking, which was chemistry and there were projects with art. So it wasn't just, here was the book, let's do a book report. It was, here was the book, here are the many ways we can explore the literature and make connections. We are studying 20th century world history. We did a project where the boys were split into two groups, one group to study the Irish Revolution and one group to study the Russian Revolution. Um, and what they did is they researched the two revolutions, they wrote scripts, and then they created a documentary. So they would import visuals and then uh, do a voiceover using their script, and then they piece all that together to make one long running documentary of about nine minutes. It was really great because they had to really work in groups, they had to figure out how to do things chronologically. They used a lot of standard techniques like writing a script, using citation, doing research, all the things they just need to learn, and then use new technology to, to make it really much more fun and creative. I really liked the project because we worked with all these different new aspects of technology. It was my first time using the GarageBand software. And same with mine. 
to get your presentation the way you want it to be instead of the way that you're confined to have it. I teach history in the upper school and one of my classes is a 12th grade honors elective on the history of political violence. At the end of the semester, what we do as our culminating experience is a hostage simulation. The scenario that the students start with is that a group of revolutionaries and or terrorists, depending on whose side you're on, has hijacked a plane. They have forced it to land. They have 120 hostages and they are trying to force uh, their government, from whom their region has been trying to secede, to release 20 prisoners of war. The students have three days to resolve this situation non-violently. They are relating everything that has happened to them in the simulation, everything their character has done and other characters have done, to specific readings, case studies, videos, news stories on violence, the nature of violence, and justifications of violence that we've looked at all year long. I think it's interesting that they're doing this approach, you know, learning how to fail, being creative, applying your knowledge in the way that you should. It definitely helps you in more real world experiences because in, in real life you're not going to be sitting in a classroom, you're going to be out trying to make things and figure things out, which is a lot more like applicable to when we graduate. I'm interested to see how it happens and how you grade it and what exactly we'll get, but I think it could be more effective in terms of again, real world skills and applying your knowledge to the best of your possible ability.